Thank you, Carol. And uh, to everyone here at the uh, Skyscraper Museum, what a terrific uh, place. We need one of these in Boston, so maybe we can try to arrange that. Um, I'd like to begin uh, the presentation by showing a few images, which is something that I do uh, as I talk about this book. This starts out around my hometown of Brookline, Massachusetts, just across the street from where I live. Another apartment building there. This you might recognize, the Christian Science uh, Complex in Boston. This is in Harvard Square. This is Boston City Hall, which the late Mayor Tom Menino once told me would make a great handball court, as far as he was concerned, anyway. <laughs> an apartment building on uh, Mount Auburn Street in Cambridge. Uh, this is an alewife, but it really could be anywhere in terms of the uh, concrete construction and the horizontal, horizontal strip windows of uh, the, the uh, ubiquitous corporate office park. Does anyone know where this is? Fall River City Hall, right? Very similar to Boston City Hall. And uh, <clears throat> this is a building in Providence. And finally, can't resist, the Hancock Tower in uh, Boston's Back Bay. So <clears throat> uh, what I hope to illustrate is that um, so much of our landscape, for better or worse, uh, has been influenced uh, by this man, Le Corbusier. He was born Charles Edouard Genere uh, in 1887 in the uh, Swiss watchmaking capital of Le Chaux de Fonds. Um, he moved to Paris in uh, the, uh, just before the 1920s and rebranded himself uh, this single moniker. Um, it's, uh, it's taken from a family name, but also translates loosely to the raven, the acrobatic bird of uh, Celtic lore. Um, and having done this, he, he set out to revolutionize design space, the way we live, and the way we inhabit cities. Um, I argue that he's really one of the first to marshal the power of public relations uh, in, uh, in architecture, uh, that he was, the, he was an original star architect um, and, uh, and really a founding father of modern architecture. Um, in this country, uh, the, the better known figure is, is probably uh, the designer of this building, Frank Lloyd Wright. The two men were rivals. I talk about in the book how if Frank Lloyd Wright was Bill Gates, then Le Corbusier was uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, they never met. Uh, Wright rebuffed uh, uh, Le Corbusier's uh, uh, request to meet in person while he was in America. Uh, and a little known fact, uh, uh, in the Guggenheim process, Le Corbusier was actually first approached and submitted a design that was a continuous ramp through the levels of the building, uh, but it was square. Um, the architect, the, the creator of the built environment, has such enduring uh, appeal to this day. Uh, figures like Frank Gehry, Ram Koolhaas, Renzo Piano, uh, Zaha Hadid, Le, uh, Le Corbusier, in this context, was, was truly a pioneer. Um, he was an original disruptor, uh, pragmatic, opportunistic, and uh, fundamentally non-ideological uh, in the conventional sense. He was a, a master of reinvention, um, uh, challenged the status quo, and expertly, if uh, rather assertively, managed a uh, team, a loyal team, uh, in his atelier. Um, what I seek to do in Modern Man is to look at what drove him, uh, what made him tick, as Carol mentioned, uh, this idea of what was behind the genius. Um, and it's a little like what uh, I might do, and indeed would long to do, and that's write a biography of Tom Brady. Uh, the quarterback for the uh, beloved New England Patriots, um, what it's like to be in that pocket, uh, to make 
uh, those split-second decisions and perform on this grand stage. Uh, but in this case, I'm looking at an architect. Um, my first books uh, were about telling stories, and um, the idea has been to bridge the world of uh, journalism, uh, academia, and um, uh, combined into contemporary book publishing. Um, there have been many books about Le Corbusier. Uh, there have been uh, uh, books about him growing up in Switzerland, uh, a book about the architect as feminist, uh, a, a book about the architect and the beach, the churches he built. Uh, and th so these are all very specialized and some of them quite technical uh, uh, books about this man. Um, and so my goal is, was to write a book uh, that um, exposed Le Carbusier to people who perhaps had no idea who he was. Um, and uh, it is designed very much for a general audience, and so it's not a scholarly uh, treatise. Um, Le Carbusier would uh, always lecture without notes, doing a sort of a PowerPoint on the fly by uh, uh, writing on these reams of newsprint. Um, and uh, similarly, I, I, I tried to take a, a little bit of a different approach in writing the book. It's not chronological, it's not linear. Rather, I explore rooms in the memory uh, palace, and in my own modest way, hope to design the narrative a little bit like one of Le, Le Carbusier's buildings, a process of theatrical discovery. Uh, but let's uh, let's give a let's try to get a sense of um, some of the early influences on his life, and and that takes us back to the uh, beginning uh, at uh, Le Chaux de Fonds, uh, where uh, he was born. Um, this is a remote place, um, and uh, Le Carbusier was very eager to get out of there pretty much as quickly as he could. Um, uh, somewhat similar to another famous son uh, of Le Chaux de Fonds, and that's Louis Chevrolet, uh, who was also born here and uh, one of the favorite sons. Now, that alone, you can come out of here with uh, a, 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 a piece of trivia that you can throw out there. Uh, so uh, ho hopefully that's a little value add. Um, it, it, the place did have a lot of influence on him. It was destroyed by fire at the end of the 19th century and the city fathers rebuilt it uh, in an orderly grid uh, with uh, buildings that were similar to those in Hausmann's Paris with the top floor ateliers uh, taking in abundant sunlight. This is where all the watchmaking was done. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the grid, uh, the buildings, the sunlight all had uh, a tremendous influence on him. Uh, Le Chaux de Fonds, by the way, is, uh, was the origin of <clears throat> many leading brands, uh, including uh, uh, Breitling and Movado. Um, so it was clear from early on that uh, Le Carbusier, as a young man, had a, had a real talent for conveying the visual. Um, he went to the local art school and studied under a terrific uh, master, Charles uh, Le Platonier, uh, who encouraged him to give architecture a try. Uh, his father wanted him to follow in his footsteps engraving watch cases, um, but uh, he escaped that fate in part because he had a uh, condition that essentially left him uh, <clears throat> partially blind in one eye. Um, <clears throat> so he wasn't going to stay home on the farm, um, uh, but before he left, uh, he uh, created some of his uh, first villas, including this uh, beautiful house, Maison Blanche, which he built for his parents. Um, and uh, as you can see, the interior is uh, delightfully modern, but this house was built in 1912, as Le Corbusier is a very young man. That's uh, his father, George's boater and cane hanging in the, in the entryway. Um, Maison Blanche ended up being a, a bit too much house for his parents. Uh, and uh, so the faithful son ended up designing another place for them to enjoy their retirement years. His father actually died and his mother lived for many, many years afterwards. Uh, I, but this was in uh, Veve, which is uh, uh, on the... Uh, was now referred to as the Swiss 
Riviera. Um, and it is the home of Nestle uh, Chocolate uh, Company and uh, also the birthplace of Charlie Chaplin. So here are some more fun facts to, uh, to take away. Um, it's a beautiful place and here he created this sort of uh, iconic minimalist uh, uh, act of modern architecture. It had a, uh, a hideaway bed uh, which was quite novel at the time. This is in the 1920s and other similar uh, features that you might see in, uh, in an Ikea uh, interior today. Um, and not to content to provide just any back patio, he added this uh, feature of the concrete frame of uh, Lake Geneva and the mountains in the distance uh, that you see on your left. As a young man, uh, encouraged by Le Platinier, he, uh, he hit the road for the equivalent of a European backpacking tour, uh, going to monasteries in Italy, which uh, ended up inspiring his housing design, and uh, also the ultimate inspiring destination, which was the Acropolis, uh, which uh, instilled in him a flair for the monumental. There was never a question, though, that he had to be in Paris. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, in his first trip, he uh, interned for the Pare brothers, which were ex who were experimenting with uh, the novel use of concrete at the time. This is around 1909. Uh, he also was an intern for Peter Behrens uh, in uh, Germany. Uh, where a fellow intern, uh, it was Mies van der Rohe, as well as, of course, uh, Walter Gropius, uh, would uh, go on to be involved in the uh, German design school, the Bauhaus. Um, he uh, ends up coming back to Paris and moving to, uh, after the Germany internship and some other travels, uh, it, uh, just as World War I was ending, and moves to this spot in the Latin Quarter, it's Rue Jacob, uh, and uh, uh, begins sort of frequenting the bistros and, and cafes of uh, Hemingway and Coco Chanel. Uh, so here he is in Paris uh, as a young man, um, uh, a voracious reader, a bit of a loner, um, uh, painting Notre Dame by day and uh, inclined to pay uh, to slake his thirst for sex at night. He's an odd duck, but he'll interest you, uh, Auguste Paré told uh, the artist and uh, collector Amade Ozenfant, uh, who was a close friend in those early years in Paris. Um, with this picture, I, I can't resist uh, a little bit of casting and, and to point out uh, that Brad Pitt would, uh, would uh, be a great uh, leading um, uh, actor uh, to play him in the movie uh, version of Modern Man. Um, uh, he sought uh, uh, to join in Paris the avant-garde uh, uh, with uh, fellow bohemians, um, primarily at first interested in painting. He thought he was going to be a great painter alongside Picasso and uh, Leger. Um, and with Ozenfant founded the journal L'Esprit Nouveau which was uh, sort of the manual uh, for ushering in the, this new era of the modern. Uh, following World War I, this idea that we could take uh, all of our technological and industrial know-how and create a better world for, for mankind. Uh, here he is hanging out with, among other people, the, the painter, uh, Fernand Leger. Um, in Paris, he made a name for himself building villas, the so-called purist villas, um, like this one. This is for his friend Amade Ozenfant in the 14th arrondissement. Uh, these were places that really revolutionized uh, the flow of space on the interior and, of course, stripped all ornamentation from the Victorian era from the exterior. White was the color of choice. Uh, and uh, these uh, became known, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, as the purest villas. He built one for uh, Gertrude Stein's brother uh, and uh, uh, another American uh, client on the outskirts of Paris. Um, so through the 1920s, um, 
he uh, establishes himself as um, uh, a, a leading uh, pioneer in architecture. He sets up an atelier next door to the Bon Marche department store in the Hotel Lutetia. Uh, and he has two uh, uh, particularly loyal uh, members of the team uh, join him uh, through that time. One was his cousin, Pierre Genoret, and the other was uh, Charlotte Perriand, who is uh, pictured here. We don't embroider cushions here, he sniffed when Charlotte Perriand first approached him uh, for a job at the atelier. Uh, but he, uh, it was all an act. He quickly realized how much talent she had, particularly, of course, in designing furniture, and he hired her shortly thereafter. Uh, so this is what he becomes known to. He's innovating alongside of uh, Gertrude Stein and Picasso and Leger, Hemingway, uh, Fitzgerald, uh, even Gershwin. Um, not only villas, but furniture, which is something that he's perhaps better known for in this country, even if people don't realize it. The uh, club chair, uh, the sort of the ubiqu ubiquitous uh, furnishing in uh, uh, dentist waiting offices and uh, cor corporate offices across the land. Um, he dabbles in designing women's clothes and he even designs a car. Um, this is the precursor, this is sort of the original Mini uh, and the precursor uh, by several years of the Volkswagen Beetle, the people's car. Uh, but uh, Le Carbusier and his cousin Pierre designed this first. Um, the villas paid the bills, but uh, Le Carbusier was not uh, content just to build standalone uh, buildings and homes. Uh, his interest was in creating a kind of repeatable urban form that could accommodate uh, the growing population of cities. So he uh, um, first uh, creates um, what, what uh, I think is uh, beautiful and very effective worker housing in the town of Pesac, uh, and then he uh, steps things up uh, originally with the uh, city for uh, three million people, and then the Plan, Plan Voisin uh, in 1925, uh, which is a scheme for 60-story housing towers uh, served by uh, wide arterials and even some uh, helipads uh, thrown in, uh, looking very much toward the future. Uh, the problem was this was in the uh, cited for the historic, uh, now historic uh, uh, area of uh, the Marais, um, in, uh, in the center of Paris. So it was an audacious uh, proposal indeed. Um, uh, as I write in the book, he felt that he needed to destroy the city in order to save it. So he was making his mark um, and was well on his way to, to becoming a celebrity. Governments all over the world were asking him to come and visit and create urban design schemes to help them build the modern city. Um, uh, just one example, in South America, he traveled to Argentina and Brazil. Um, he flew in style in uh, ocean liners and uh, uh, dirigibles and later the, the, the first uh, uh, passenger airlines. Uh, and he would always step off onto the tarmac, natally dressed in uh, suit and bow tie and pocket square and, of course, his trademark round black glasses. Um, and he was always ready for romance as well. And here I'd like to read from the uh, uh, introduction of Modern Man, uh, where he uh, meets the jazz singer uh, Josephine Baker. And she's pictured there on board the Lutetia. He watched her for what seemed like hours, her chest rising and falling as the big boat did the same on the waves of the Atlantic. They'd left Rio de Janeiro uh, for the long trip back to France, nestled in crisp white sheets in a first-class cabin aboard the Lutetia, the black ocean outside the portal window. Time was a relative matter as the ship made a vector for the equator. The year was 1929. The Roaring Twenties were about to end with the stock market crash, but no such realities would intervene in that stateroom. Propped up on one elbow, he could hardly believe his good fortune, meeting Josephine Baker in Buenos Aires several days before. 
In Rio, they sipped Caprinas and sauntered along Ipanema Beach. And she was lo so lovely, he created portraits of her using the colored pencils he had brought for work. On board, they attended an elaborate costume party. He dressed as an Indian soldier with a polka dot bandana. She is a China doll. What a pity you're an architect, Monsieur Le Carbusier, she had said. You'd have made such a sensational partner. Uh, some of the uh, uh, comments on the uh, Amazon reviews have, have, have questioned, well, you know, how do we know this? How do we know how he was feeling about being on that ocean liner with Josephine Baker? And uh, incredibly, just as a side note, we know this because he wrote uh, uh, religiously to his mother. And he actually included all of these details, almost in a kind of a boastful kind of way, uh, about meeting Josephine Baker and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, we know this because uh, he wrote it all down in letters. And those are all, of course, in the archive. Um, well, we'll see, uh, as we'll see, he never really settled down. Uh, but it, he did end up marrying Yvonne Gallus, um, a, a, a fashion model from Monaco. Um, she was a gypsy spirit with a, uh, a love for practical jokes. Uh, she once put a whoopee cushion uh, as a visiting priest was sitting down under, <laughs> under that gentleman. Um, and uh, interestingly, she forbade the discussion of architecture at the dinner table or at home. Uh, they, uh, they actually did not have uh, that common interest. Um, and so she would spend many days uh, at home while her husband traveled the world, uh, smoking cigarettes and sipping pastis earlier and earlier in the day. Uh, back in Paris, uh, he creates uh, in the suburbs outside of the city in uh, Poesy uh, around 1929, what I uh, describe as the architectural equivalent of the iPhone. Um, the Villa Savoie uh, was based on his five points of architecture, which include raising the building up on pilotis, or these concrete pillars, um, opening up the floor plan, uh, freeing the facade of structural uh, requirements, putting a garden on the roof, and uh, horizontal strip windows to let in light. Uh, going through the Villa Savoie was this act of uh, uh, a promenade of discovery, a, a, a kind of a theatrical uh, experience, and that was how he um, uh, hoped that uh, his architecture would have that effect. Um, it was for a couple who uh, wanted a country house in the suburbs, basically. It was near a golf course that Pierre Savoy wanted to play at. Uh, he was big in the insurance business. Uh, so they wanted a, a country house, uh, the equivalent of uh, Fairfield County, Connecticut, uh, but uh, Le Carbusier gave them a work of art. Uh, he really pushed the limits in terms of the materials and the construction methods that, uh, that he used for the Villa Savoie. Um, one other notable uh, achievement was to kind of push uh, architecture into the realm of the political. Uh, so he founded uh, SIAM, which was the Congress for International uh, Modern Architecture. And, um, traveled around to uh, uh, municipal governments and nation states and tried to convince them that the modernist agenda had a lot to offer them, that they could um, uh, remake their cities uh, and uh, usher in uh, the modern era. Uh, it's worth noting that the, uh, another group with very different aims, the Congress for the New Urbanism, also called itself uh, Congress, and in fact, uh, based itself on uh, Siam. Here he is on a boat on, on a way to one of the raucous convenings of this group uh, in, uh, in Athens around about 1933. Well, World War II uh, interrupted his ascent and, uh, and everyone else's, um, but uh, it set the stage for uh, the darker chapter of his life, um, he traveled to the spa town of Vichy uh, to ingratiate himself with the collaborationist government, hoping to become a kind of a minister of urbanism, the equivalent of a HUD secretary for this new uh, government and address uh, housing and urbanism. His attempts at networking uh, with um, uh, 
some of these characters uh, ended fairly quickly. Uh, he, uh, he was there amid the cocked berets and the, and the sidearms of a very, of a very dangerous and, uh, uh, and quickly shifting kind of place. Uh, so he returned to Paris, opportunist, and that he was. Um, he was courted by Mussolini. He, uh, he did work in the Soviet Union, uh, including the Palace of Soviets, which is unexecuted in Moscow, pictured here. Um, and uh, he could be criticized for being a capitalist, a communist, and a fascist all at the same time. Uh, so in this way, he was always chasing the commission. The end of the war brought him uh, back to America. Um, and uh, as Carol mentioned, he had a complicated relationship with America and New York City in particular. He first visited in 1935. Uh, at that time, he disembarked from the SS Normandy uh, and thought that he was going to be welcomed as a great celebrity and, and expert on urbanism and city building. Uh, of course, no one was there. and. Uh, uh, his guide at the time uh, had to bribe a photographer, pay a photographer five dollars to snap pictures of him as if he was the paparazzi. And uh, he actually uh, didn't even have any film in the camera, but uh, th <laughs> this led uh, Le Carbusier to keep bugging him for days afterwards, saying, I, where are my pictures? I don't see them in the newspaper. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> the visitor from Paris uh, made uh, a, a bit of a spectacle of himself. Uh, he was photographed in his glasses and uh, uh, looking for all the world like uh, an egghead, which uh, actually the, uh, uh, the term was first deployed to describe him in that way on this visit. Um, Skyscrapers not big enough, blared the headline uh, after uh, Le Carbusier dis uh, critiqued uh, the, uh, the way that uh, the towers of Manhattan uh, were being built. Uh, and deciding that they were uh, insufficiently staffed, uh, spaced apart and should be more monumental and on, um, uh, on platforms uh, uh, raised up and, of course, should be bigger and taller and should go all the way north. Um, uh, he traveled uh, at, during that first trip uh, to a, a lot of other places, including college campuses, where he was actually much more popular. He was surrounded by students who wanted him to, uh, you know, wanted his autograph. Now that was more more like it. Um, he also traveled to Chicago, uh, um, and uh, that was when he tried to meet with Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, to Michigan, where he uh, met with Eero Saarinen and uh, marveled at the River Rouge auto assembly plant. Uh, he went to Boston and met a young man named I. M. Pei, uh, and uh, uh, it was um, it had the potential to be kind of a, a trip of a of a rock star as an architect, uh, but in the end he was quite critical of America, and as uh, Carol mentioned, wrote uh, the book when cathedrals were white, which was sort of uh, a, a, um, a very French uh, or European critique of America uh, at the time. Um, he uh, uh, becomes involved uh, after the war with the design by committee for the United Nations complex on the banks of the East River. Um, and ultimately, he's unhappy that he doesn't get uh, sole credit uh, for, um, uh, for, for the design, which is essentially his. And as you can see here in one of his many drama queen moments, uh, he has someone take a picture showing his original uh, sketch uh, with the UN building in the background, and uh, as if to say, you know, this, this is really mine. And in, indeed it is. Uh, there were some compromises in working with Oscar Niemeyer, uh, but uh, this was a, uh, another complicated experience uh, working on the United Nations uh, uh, complex uh, w while he was here in New York for, uh, for a period of time. Um, but again, back in France, the, uh, the years following World War II really uh, started a comeback uh, for this man. Uh, incredibly, he befriends Charles de Gaulle. Uh, despite his uh, entreaties to the Vichy government. 
um, and uh, is uh, kind of embeds himself with the effort uh, to create post-war housing uh, in Europe, uh, badly needed, and ends up uh, uh, executing uh, this, the Unité d'Habitation. Uh, it's a 337 apartment um, building in uh, Marseille. The first one was in Marseille. Uh, and uh, I believe a, a masterful, excuse me, design of density. Uh, he has Picasso come and visit um, uh, uh, during the construction. Uh, and uh, I love this picture. Well, the, look at the shirts, you know, unbuttoned <laughs> nearly to the belt. I mean, just completely gratuitous. But uh, mm. uh, Picasso viewed it as pretty interesting and a, and a work of art and uh, signaling really a new way to live. Um, and indeed, the, the uh, um, interlocking uh, duplex apartments with uh, uh, a balcony and floor-to-ceiling uh, picture windows at either end um, was uh, quite uh, new for its time. It was uh, a, a all-in-one kind of apartment building uh, that included a school and a gym uh, and open space on the roof, a supermarket on the third floor, uh, a barber, and a cinema, and um, uh, this was the vertical city, the happy hive, as he described it. And Unité d'Habitation was important for another reason. It was based on a new system that he had created called the modular. Um, and uh, this was uh, supposed to be the blueprint for how humans uh, move and use uh, space. Um, it's, uh, it's based on some uh, incredible, almost mystic uh, stuff, including uh, uh, mathematics uh, that, um, uh, as I describe in the book, uh, is uh, traced back to the Fibonacci sequence and uh, has to do ultimately with um, the Da Vinci Code. Um, and uh, uh, what I think is most valuable about it is that Le Corbusier meant it to be used by anyone. It was sort of open source long before the term uh, is used today. Uh, and Albert Einstein, pictured here, who he met with in Princeton, uh, said that uh, it made uh, the difficult look easy and uh, praised uh, the system of the modular. And so by 1960, uh, thereabouts, he lands on the cover of Time magazine, the, uh, the, the ultimate achievement and finally the sort of hero's welcome that he was uh, hoping for some years before. As a work of architecture, uh, the chapel at Ronchamp um, would seal his position as a pioneer. Uh, as part of this comeback, um, the Catholic Church commissioned a man who had no use for organized religion uh, to, to build this uh, sacred space. Uh, but like Blake writing Jerusalem, uh, the end result is an otherworldly structure of, of staggering beauty on a hilltop uh, in eastern France. It's actually not far from Le Chaudefon and the, and the Swiss border uh, further east. Um, this is a shot of the interior. Uh, when we visited, uh, a French group uh, sang a, a hymn. The acoustics are amazing. I don't know if uh, people have ever visited. It's, it's, it's well worth uh, uh, the trip. Actually, Renzo Piano uh, recently designed a visitor center to accompany uh, the chapel at Ronchamp. Um, here, of course, is another sacred space that he designed, the monastery at La Tourette. Um, and it's been recently uh, renovated and restored to the great credit of the French government. Um, and it's the destination uh, on, on a, uh, another destination on the uh, architectural pilgrimage tour. I actually wrote a travel story for the Boston Globe about this, suggesting these uh, these various destinations. While we were there, um, there was a group of uh, architecture students from Japan, um, and they uh, t drank in all of the, all of the features um, uh, that uh, were inherent in uh, La Tourette. Um, one uh, worker installed a, a feature uh, upside down, essentially, and Le Corbusier said, that's fine. It shows that this was built by man and not, indeed, by God. 
So here I am delighting the Japanese architecture students by striking the pose of the modular man, uh, which is a six foot tall man with his uh, arm raised up to the ceiling, essentially, uh, to suggest uh, the, uh, the needs of, uh, uh, of moving and inhabiting space. Um, these were masterworks, to be sure, uh, but uh, the crowning achievement also came in this period of the 1950s, uh, where he got his big chance to build, to do what he always wanted to do, which was to build a city from scratch. Um, Chandigarh, in uh, just about 200 kilometers north of Delhi, um, a new provincial capital for the Punjab state was needed because of the partition, and so Prime Minister Nehru uh, ended up uh, commissioning Le Corbusier uh, for, for this um, act of city building. And so here, as I conclude, I'd like to make a final uh, brief reading from the introduction, the first uh, paragraph of the chapter about Chandigarh, which I call simply the city. The Air India jet banked over the Himalayan plain, tilting the first-class cabin toward an expansive view of the northern region, all the way up toward the foothills in Shimla, the former summertime capital of the Raj. Rivers appeared as long muddy ribbons with a thin stream of water in the center. The long stretches of flat, khaki-colored land were sprinkled with clusters of green bushes and trees and a few huts here and there. Le Corbusier looked down and remembered how he had, in a similar fashion from the Graf Zeppelin, surveyed Brazil 20 years and a lifetime ago. That was a different kind of chaos, the rivers meandering wildly through the jungle. Now, over India, half a world away, he leaned close to the jet's oval window and pictured a grid to organize humanity, an order to be imposed on an increasingly crowded nation and grand monuments befitting the new republic. The blank canvas was before him. There was earth to be moved. So here is the fruits of his labor, in part, in the Capitol complex. Of course, the uh, parliament building at uh, Chandigarh. And then finally, back in America, um, this is actually Le Corbusier's only building in North America, the Carpenter Center on the campus of Harvard University. Um, the, uh, uh, the building last year celebrated its 50th anniversary. Uh, right next door is the Harvard Art Museum, which Renzo Piano has uh, completed a, a, a redesign and an expansion. Um, and uh, uh, Le Corbusier visited Harvard uh, on two occasions working with his good friend, uh, Jose Luis Sert, who uh, at the time uh, previously was uh, dean of the Harvard Architectural School, the uh, Graduate School of Design. Um, but he didn't uh, attend the ribbon cutting. Instead, he was spending more and more time here. Architecture is hard, he was uh, fond of saying, and this hard-charging man needed a getaway. And he found that uh, here at Rockbrun Cap Martin, uh, a seaside village uh, just by Monaco, um, he and Yvonne would spend days drinking wine and eating sea urchins at the uh, L'Etoile de Mer, the restaurant next door to the cabin he builds for himself, uh, which is again based on the principles of the modular, an impossibly small space. It drove Yvonne crazy. <laughs> Uh, but it's somewhat similar to the, to the minimalist beach houses that we see in, in, in publications like Dwell. Um, uh, and uh, Le Carbusier would uh, go for a swim uh, each day uh, out in the Mediterranean. Um, his introduction to Rockbrun Cap Martin uh, was, uh, was staying at E1027, which was a villa designed by Eileen Gray who actually had critiqued uh, Le Corbusier's uh, adage that the home was a machine for living in. Gray's lover at the time allowed uh, Le Corbusier and Yvonne to stay in, in the villa, uh, and this is just a uh, short ways down from the cabin he ends up building for himself. Um, and of course, he promptly wears out his welcome by painting 
as you can see, as it happens, in the nude, of course, I mean, how else would one do this? Um, uh, some rogue murals, uh, racy uh, uh, content on the white walls of Eileen Gray's villa. Uh, she was very upset about this and uh, considered it. So this is sort of the, an act of modernist graffiti, if you will, um, and, a great, uh, and a great story that's uh, part of the chapter about his time in Rockbrun Cap Martin. By the way, this, uh, this part of the story is the subject of a, uh, a forthcoming film uh, that uh, includes uh, uh, the, uh, the singer-actress Alanis Morissette. So keep your eye out for that. Um, Rock Foon Cap Martin, uh, where Coco Chanel uh, uh, had a villa uh, not far away, was, uh, was hard by Monaco, um, was really the absolute highlight in researching this book. I know it's hard work. Somebody had to do it. Um, but it's, it's truly a magical place. So you can understand why he liked it so much. Uh, the uh, sort of the assault on the senses of, of smell and sight and, and, and sound. Um, he said that he would likely end his days there, and, uh, and indeed he did, uh, when in 1965, in August, uh, he walked down to the water for the last time, plunged in, uh, and um, he did this against doctor's orders who had, tell him, who had told him to quit swimming uh, because of a heart condition he had. Um, so he went out, though, on, uh, somewhere out on those rolling waves uh, and uh, perhaps uh, saw the, the sea urchins dotting uh, the sea floor uh, before everything turned to black. So it's quite a story. Uh, and um, uh, I, uh, I hope that it's, it is indeed a, a narrative biography of genius. But as I talk about the book, uh, one thing become, becomes apparent. It's sort of the elephant in the room. And that is, how can I possibly celebrate this man? Uh, he called for the bulldozing of central Paris, after all. Uh, he gave us towers in the park, uh, top-down planning, when we all know that uh, what we should be doing is participatory planning that involves the citizenry. Uh, he tried to kill the street and separate uses, when we know now today that it's all about the street and a mix of uses and a human scale. Um, uh, he was uh, paternalistic, uh, uh, mercurial, a serial philanderer, and he was French. Um, uh, pass me the freedom fries. Um, though born in Switzerland, he became a French citizen in 1930. Um, the towers in the park, in particular, have really stayed in the uh, uh, in, the, in the history of, of, of planning through the end of the 20th century uh, as just a terrible mistake. This is an illustration taken from a UN Habitat uh, exhibit. I love the guy. He's, I don't know if you can see it, but he's hanging on to his hat in the windswept plaza uh, by these towers. Um, so, bad idea. Um, a, a version, uh, a, a bad copy of his um, uh, proposal for density and housing seen here at uh, the pruitt Igo housing project, which was famously uh, demolished and really represents uh, the worst of uh, planning uh, that really doesn't take into account uh, people's actual needs. Um, so right up front, this is, this is warts and all. Uh, I say, as I uh, mentioned on uh, Leonard uh, uh, Lopate today, that he had some terrifically bad ideas, uh, and I think we're all thankful that uh, the center of Paris was not, in fact, uh, bulldozed for the uh, Plan Voisin. Um, the, uh, uh, the way that he ended up influencing America was sort of more than he uh, ever would have dreamed of, in a way, um, and indeed, this is what uh, helped inspire me to write this book because of my previous book, where he makes a cameo and ends up inspiring effectively Robert Moses um, with the uh, arterials and elevated highways, such as the unexecuted Mid-Manhattan Expressway, uh, and um, a laudable attempt, uh, I would argue, to increase the supply of housing 
uh, with uh, the superblock concept and more density, uh, as we see here in uh, this, for example, southeast uh, Washington Square, southeast, not far from here. Um, by the end of the 20th century, uh, arguably the uh, uh, the spotlight belonged to this woman, um, Jane Jacobs, uh, the David to Moses's Goliath, uh, and the and the driving uh, force in the in in the narrative uh, that continues to this day uh, about uh, planning uh, and uh, the human scale. Um, well, here's where I. Uh, make the pitch that there are uh, uh, some useful lessons to be learned from uh, Le Corbusier. And so I'll go through this very quickly. Um, as many of you know, uh, the uh, urban population of the world is rising dramatically. Um, the world population right now is about 6 billion. Uh, recently, over half of those people uh, are uh, living in cities. Uh, by 2050 and a little bit beyond, the projection is that the world population will be 9 billion, and 6 billion of those 9 billion will live in cities. Uh, so the 21st century is the urban century. Uh, in um, the coming years, just to 2030, we'll add 2.5 billion new urban residents. Um, uh, places like India will grow by 400 million uh, people. So that's uh, an entire new United States of America. But you can't put anybody uh, in places like Nebraska. They're all going to be living in cities. Um, they're moving there as rural migrants in search of a better life. Uh, and they're moving there by the millions. Um, these uh, uh, population counts uh, from 2000 are going to look downright quaint and manageable by comparison, uh, virtually all of this growth is going to occur, occur in uh, the developing world in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And uh, in places like Mumbai, it's going to go from easily 20 million to 40 million. Uh, the same with Beijing, uh, over 40 million uh, as we look at uh, these uh, giant metropolitan areas. Um, the alternative uh, to planning is this, um, slums, favelas, shanty towns, uh, irregular, unplanned settlement without basic services such as uh, water and sanitation. Um, the UN estimates that about one billion people are currently living in informal settlement. Um, and uh, many of uh, the rural migrants are, are they're simply moving directly to informal settlement. Uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, in particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, this is how our cities are, in the developing world are expanding. Um, there's been very little preparation uh, for this urban expansion and some of the work that we've done at the Lincoln Institute um, with uh, Solly Angel and the folks at uh, NYU is looking at the character of this urban expansion. We have something called the Atlas of Urban Expansion which is a way to measure the way our cities are truly growing. And uh, our work, Planet of Cities, or Making Room for a Planet of Cities, which suggests these basic steps. Uh, planning a grid, it's actually much like the grid of Manhattan uh, and, the, and, the, and the Planning Commission, um, uh, or uh, uh, what ended up happening in Barcelona as well, establishing a grid, uh, arterials of uh, one kilometer apart, uh, for the blocks to, 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 to follow in, uh, planning now for open space and, of course, transportation and, and, and similar infrastructure. So uh, this is the context for um, uh, the uh, kind of a, a bit of a response to the criticism of top-down planning or really of big plans. Uh, so I will argue that um, perhaps the pendulum has swung a little bit too far, um, and uh, uh, we, we might not be able to accommodate this urban expansion with uh, this, this kind of devotion to the Greenwich Village model, uh, and that uh, we need um, uh, planning uh, to get us uh, through the challenges of infrastructure and regional um, collaboration across these vast metropolitan areas and, uh, and uh, preparing for the impacts of climate change. 
Uh, finally, as I uh, conclude, I think some of Le Corbusier's best contributions were, in fact, in housing design. Uh, super efficient, small. We see this today with uh, micro housing and micro apartments. Uh, very big here in New York City. Um, and this is an example of one that uh, won the competition that Mayor Bloomberg started. Uh, this is a recognition of a changing demographic, a lot more singles, uh, people that would like to rent, uh, and they have the city at their doorstep, and so their actual living needs are, 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 are much, uh, much simpler. Um, the uh, uh, picture here is of one of the, the smallest uh, cells at La Tourette, uh, which is similar to the, some of the smallest rooms uh, studio apartments, if you will, in Unité d'Habitation. Part of Unité in Marseille has been turned over, turned into a hotel, and uh, and we we stay there on our visit there. And uh, the hotel manager, uh, uh, before she shows a couple the smallest rooms in the hotel, pauses for a moment before opening the door and says, "Are you in love?" <laughs> uh, so these are small places, but they're efficient places and so well designed that. Uh, this surely will be part of the equation uh, for providing safe, and decent, affordable housing for these many millions of city residents. Um, it's also part of the formula, I would argue, for a more sustainable uh, urbanism. Uh, some of the influence is already uh, plainly stated by folks like uh, Bjark Engels, uh, who created this, the Eight House. Um, and uh, in uh, some of the... Uh, 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 smaller apartments in design comp competitions, particularly a lot of interesting stuff coming out, of course, Japan uh, for a more efficient use of space uh, with the uh, amenities outside. And, and this is all part of a, a, a more uh, sustainable uh, future and for the, uh, uh, the density of cities uh, served by transit systems that are actually more environmentally friendly places uh, to be for the future. So I'll leave you with that notion. Um, if it's possible to create an urban form in harmony with the landscape all around uh, and in recognition of the enduring human relationship with nature, an elegant, nimble, comprehensive approach to design, um, planning for scale, uh, density, and efficiency, as the hallmarks of the future. Uh, the architecture of the people, he argued, can be beautiful. Uh, and so to those who see nothing at all redeemable about this man, uh, my audacious suggestion is to, uh, to not throw out uh, the baby with the modernist bathwater uh, and that uh, uh, to avoid uh, really a lot of widespread suffering uh, in terms of this rampant informal settlement in the developing world cities, we're going to need innovative thinkers in design, in housing, uh, and uh, in urban planning and, and urban design. And I think uh, Le Carbusier uh, really um, uh, forged a, a, a path in that respect. He was uh, uh, disruptive, he was innovative, uh, and that's the kind of thinking I think we're going to need for uh, um, uh, not only for uh, our con contemporary landscape, but um, for uh, more promise for the planet as he may yet become the architect of tomorrow. Thank you very much. So I just want to take a quick moment to thank the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, where I am a fellow uh, that has supported this work, and uh, two institutions, the American Library in Paris and the Rockefeller Foundation and its uh, Bellagio Center. Uh, and here's all my contact information, and I'd uh, be happy to, to inscribe books as anybody wishes. And also draw your attention to uh, a, a new feature, which is my that I'm very proud of, and that's the playlist on Spotify. Uh, go and check it out, uh, for those of you on Spotify. Uh, it's called Modern Man, and each track sort of accompanies the narrative in what I hope to be some, some interesting ways. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to just open it up for a conversation and, and questions and comments and, uh, and open it up to, to, to everyone.
Who might be willing to go for it? Sure, all of it. Was it the Switzerland that's where Charlie Chaplin died? His home, his hometown, uh, what he ended up, his adopted hometown. Yes, you're absolutely right. I misspoke. Uh, the, uh, Le Carbusier, he didn't, he didn't have children, yeah, he, he wanted nothing to do with it. And, uh, you know, as a parent, I can sort of sympathize a little bit. I, uh, it would get in the way of his career, I guess, but he ended up uh, adopting uh, uh, kids, though, as kind of his own. And, um, uh, and one example of that was the restaurateur's uh, son, uh, Robert Revertatu, who, who uh, ran the uh, L'Etoile de Mer. Uh, and so his son, uh, growing up, uh, uh, Le Carbusier kind of adopted as his own. I was lucky to actually interview him because he's still there. And the restaurant isn't open, but, the, but he was there and I got a chance to talk to him. Desperately wishing I'd paid more attention in my high school French class, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious, the picture of a nude, was that a scar or a tattoo on his leg? Yeah, I should, uh, I, should, I should note that because it looks like a shark attack, but in fact, it was a propeller. He had a, a, a run-in with a boat while he was out swimming oh. uh, and uh, uh, nearly died. And uh, um, uh, one of the treatments actually ended up being, as uh, you'll see in the book, uh, tied to, in an interesting way to his relationships that he tried to build in uh, Vichy. Uh, one of the doctors uh, there um, for, uh, for the treatment of, of his leg. Um, and he was very heroic about all of this. He wrote in a letter to his mother how, you know, he was fine, but it was, it was pretty hairy. And uh, he had to be, you know, sort of brought to the shore and, 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 and whisked to the, uh, to the hospital. But that's what that is, yes. Scarred in, in many ways. Yes. Um, he very much wanted to. So that, that bit where he's with Josephine Baker and you know, he's having a great time and, and the Brazil government uh, asked him to come and be a consultant and to advise them on expanding their cities and, and, uh, uh, and uh, trying to address housing uh, in a uh, uh, systematic way, and the same in uh, Argentina and uh, Buenos Aires. They never, he, he never quite sealed the deal. There's one building that, that's essentially his in, in Rio, the Ministry of Culture, um, and uh, he teams up, or, uh, the, the, the man, of course, who, who was sort of an intern at the beginning or an apprentice was Oscar Niemeyer. And so Brazil ends up turning to him with places like Brasilia because he's one of their own. And, you know, we can't have this European guy come here and uh, design our cities for us. So that's a short version of what, what ended up happening in Brazil. Yeah, uh, the, uh, Oscar Niemeyer and Le Corbusier, yes, very much so. They had a, a kind of a complicated relationship, but you can see this is a common theme. Uh, and of course, he was younger and... Uh, viewed, uh, you know, Le Carbusier as more of the master, but then, you know, the, the uh, Oscar Niemeyer ends up sort of, you know, rising up and he's got his own ideas and, uh, of course, with uh, Brasilia, but also in the United Nations uh, design. Uh, he's, uh, the, the, the final design is essentially a kind of a compromise between Le Carbusier and Niemeyer. So the apprentice kind of rises up and gets feisty with a master. Yes? Stephen Fowler, in his uh, visit to New York, he wrote in cathedrals his, how much he loved the George Washington Bridge, the great structure, the exposed uh, architecture field. And of course, as we know the story of the bridge, it was supposed to have been clad in stone and concrete by Cass Gilbert, a much different, more modernist version, in fact, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, you know, he, he loved, when he was here, he also loved, for example, the, the, the I, I believe it's later called the Pulaski Skyway, the, what was in place at the time over in, across the river. 
and he and another lady friend um, w w drove around in her uh, car, and, uh, and he just loved being up on that kind of infrastructure uh, and uh, 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 riding with this uh, particular woman um, who was not his wife as well. Um, so he kind of combined sex and, and infrastructure, which I think is a, is a neat trick. Um, and uh, he uh, was also appreciative of uh, the uh, concrete uh, silo uh, grain elevators. And, uh, and uh, on his tri trip, he caught a little bit of that and was just loved, you know, the kind of thing that you see in Buffalo and these smooth concrete, you know, that that's all it was representing uh, uh, the, uh, the, qu the qualities of what he called that most faithful of materials. Uh, so it's an interesting question about whether he liked uh, the bridge, you know, as it was and not as it was uh, 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 supposed to have been executed. Uh, but he, he loved, like many of the modernists, um, this sort of muscular and um, uh, un- uh, unadorned uh, quality of uh, of infrastructure. Did Sorry. Uh, did he have a critique of Grand Central? I. Uh, um, he he walked around, as I say in the book, on that first visit in 1935, and 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 he was looking around like this, and he he writes that he felt like he was almost going to, you know, fall over backwards. He was so in awe of, for example, the Empire State Building. Um, the uh, Grand Central Terminal, I'm not sure he singled out, but, it, you know, he, there was a lot to like about uh, Manhattan at the time, and, uh, and he was certainly appreciative and admiring of uh, buildings like uh, the Empire State Building. But I, I think when he visited here, he felt like he had to have a critique he had to have something that he could bring to America to suggest that there was a better way, that we could do it even better, that we could build our cities even better if we, if we just listened to him. But he, he appreciated many features of, of New York City at that time in the 30s. Yeah. Uh, when Lou Kahn worked in India, was that also Chandigarh? Where did he work? Um, it was elsewhere, yeah. Chandigarh was, uh, was uh, Le Corbusier's alone. It ended up being the... And uh, Le Corbusier uh, had uh, another, the Mill Owners Building, beautiful building in, uh, uh, I always mispronounce it, uh, Amamadad. Um, and uh, uh, he loved India. He, he loved going there and uh, it felt like uh, uh, it, was a, it was a great environment for him to, you know, really execute his, his grand ideas. Um, Chandigarh is an interesting place to visit uh, today. Um, it is, you know, when you, when you fly into it and you've been to places like Mumbai or New Delhi, it's just, it's the only place with a grid. Uh, but on the ground, it's, uh, you know, you, you pretty much to get around, you, you need a car. Uh, and uh, it's taken in, it was designed for 300 to 400 million people. And now, of course, you know, it has many more than that. It, um, and... Uh, uh, there's even some informal settlement that's built up there. Uh, but the long blocks are, are uh, just, you know, I don't know how anybody walks there in the, in, in the summer heat. Um, and then the other unfortunate thing about the capital complex is that uh, because of the tensions with Pakistan, it's, it's all roped off with uh, essentially machine gun nests. And you need three different permits uh, to just to even walk in there um, and and look around. So it's it, it's it's quite desolate now, but the idea was to have this grand monumental capital complex. So India was very important to him. The uh, so I I've, I've put it in the set, in the playlist. I put in some Beatles songs, uh, you know, for that whole India experience, which was part of what he was feeling. I like to think. Did I miss? Uh, uh, yes. <clears throat> Sounds like you visited a lot of his buildings. <laughs> Do you have a personal favorite, or you think that there's a, a, a building that stands out as his most successful? And do you have a least favorite or least successful? 
Well, I start, starting with the least successful, I guess I was slightly disappointed with Chandigarh because it's such a dramatic moment in the narrative that he finally gets to go and build a, a, a city and, uh, from scratch. And I guess I was kind of hoping that it would just somehow be more successful than, than I found it, you know, which is sort of like it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Maryland suburb in the seven, you know, from the 70s. Um, uh, and for the most successful buildings, that's an excellent question. My head says Unité d'Habitation in Marseille as uh, well-designed density and with a lot of great lessons for accommodating these many millions of people moving to cities in, in decent, efficient housing. My heart thinks of Ronchamp. And, you know, that, that's just a it's, a, it's an amazing place to visit. And, you, you know, you sort of walk up the hill and, uh, you know, it, it's a bit indulgent in a way. It's sort of like it's pure form. But uh, there's a lot of stuff that really works about that as a sacred space. And you can really see him as an artist, uh, and so I so I admire that uh, very much. It was it was just fantastic researching this book. I hope uh, everyone uh, feels that alongside of me, as uh, if they, if they are if they would honor me by by reading it uh, and uh, sort of tracing or following along in the footsteps of uh, Le Corbusier. I think we've reached our time. Thank you. I hope you have to buy a book. There are, there are books over here, but also go down. you can go down in the store where there are also books and then bring one up for our signature. And there's a glass of wine or water um, here for reception, so we can all prepare to prepare for that and ask Bless. questions if you have them. Thank you for coming. Here in the space, how many people are in here? We uh, do two uh, exhibitions a year, and I saw, it was to my delight, I saw some people actually walking around and looking at the exhibition. That's what that's the idea that we open, so that you have a chance to look around. This one, called Times Square 1984, it looks at Times Square 30 years ago when it was a, uh, a den of iniquity on 42nd Street and uh, was confronted with uh, many problems of urban crisis. Uh, and lots of opportunity. So you can come back and you can spend more time with the exhibition. And I hope <coughs> that you'll come to the museum on uh, a monthly basis when we hold these book talks once a month on the subject of skyscrapers, urban history, New York City history, and a, a wide range of topics around the idea of, of urbanism, urbanism um, and, of course, of architecture. Um, we. Uh, this is the, the second time that we've been able to welcome Anthony Flint for a, a wonderful talk because um, I think some of you are here because you know his, his book, uh, Wrestling with, with Moses, and the longer uh, title of that is uh, Wrestling with Moses, How Jane Jacobs Took on New York's Master Builder and Transformed the American City. Um, one of his, his other books, and I'll introduce him in a moment, but that this idea of urbanism and urban participation and a, a, a social history and a social context to the life of architects and urbanists is, um, is also the topic of the book on Corbusier, the, the biography that's the subject for tonight. Um, so we, we love to look at um, geniuses of architecture. We love to look at the context of world architecture. And, and Le Corbusier did, did come to America and wrote one of his, his books about the uh, that incorporated New York, one cathedral to the light. But this, this um, idea is certainly something which is close to my heart as an architectural historian. Um, I certainly was schooled in the generation of uh, the masters of modern architecture. And I think a, a lot of well, what my generation of scholars did was to, to kind of break down that uh, look at the, the geniuses of Wright and Meese and Corbusier and Grobius gets thrown in there as well as, as a genius or certainly a, as a, a, a taste maker. Um, at, but um, as much as I think we fought about, we, we fought with a, a monographic view or a Schaefer's view of the geniuses that were these overarching influences in the life of, of art 
architects, um, in the education of architects, and in the scope of, of architectural um, influence around the world. As much as we fought against that, there still is this um, incredibly potent idea of the narrative of the architect architectural genius, and certainly Corbusier um, is that, undeniably so. At the same time, my um, young uh, employees who are here, here tonight and are fascinated by Corbusier, I think are of a generation that missed, because people like me were teaching, that they may have missed the idea um, of, a, um, a, of a, a form giver of a, ma of, a, of a master builder. And so they're incredibly engaged by the idea of a biography of uh, Le Corbusier. So this is extraordinarily, it's extraordinary that, um, that here is, here's a, a biography that where there was a, still a niche to do it on a, on a person who was for so many years so, um, so much studied. So we have Anthony Flint to, to thank for that. Um, so Anthony is a fellow, to get it right, at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, um, <laughs> where he uh, does um, journalism, outreach, uh, communications, and oversees many of their uh, initiatives for, uh, um, for, for looking at issues um, surrounding um, land policy. His training is as a journalist, and I mentioned his, his previous book. Um, he uh, certainly is a, a writer and a, a thinker about cities and architecture that gives us a lens on, um, that, on those professions which doesn't come out of minus one of art history, but is something um, which is, uh, is a kind of rich uh, narrative. So it's uh, delightful to be able to introduce him tonight so he can tell us some stories. Great, thank you very much.